For many years now, Russ and Craig have had many wide-ranging conversations with folks from all over the gaming world. This is one of those conversations. D6G, the last chapter. So I thought it was interesting, given what... 40 what 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 games workshop just did with warhammer fantasy yeah you know what i'm saying mm. and what you know who we should talk about this particular topic to regarding the war machine hordes versus the whoa still a little sick yeah. uh versus the crawl. warhammer have thing another, another would be norbert it's too bad norbert moved to england yeah it's oh. a shame wait, norbert, it, wait, wait, what are you doing in dunkin donuts I'm norbert? Right here. Norbert. <laughs> <laughs> you I, came all the way back for a donut yeah, well, there great. are no Dunkin' Donuts in London or in the UK, as far as I know. Wait, and what? So I'm canceling my trip. There's, not a, there's no Dunkin' Donuts in London? No, you no. might. I, you have to go to the mainland, I believe. There, I may be wrong, but I do know there are Dunkin' Donuts in Italy. What passes? Now, Norbert, how have you lived in England for so long without a Dunkin' Donuts? What, what, do, you yeah. guys, what do you guys eat for breakfast tasty treats over there? <laughs> yeah. Well, you a see, you're not, you're not married to the t- a health fanatic like me. Oh. <laughs> Maybe Wait, so or what? Are you eating like egg white omelets and you know kale? Yeah, we, let's put it this way: the donuts don't appear on the menu. Oh, just, Nor- Norbert, did your wife bring you to England so that you couldn't get donuts? Is that what you're telling us? A big conspiracy. Wow. You know, you make. Give me thick now. Mm. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I will tell you. Layers you know upon I, layers, not unlike a cream cake. <laughs> oh, or the new cronut. So, the, 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 there are two things that are happening here. One is that um, Krispy Kreme has made a small uh, inroad into uh, England. Okay, that's, that's something. We'll take you that. don't find shops, but they only have them like in supermarkets, like as a like a little as stand a thing. somewhere. Someone's um, baking them, yeah. But they're considered quite trendy, and so like each one is a, I think I looked at they're two pounds each, or maybe two fifty. What for a single yeah. donut? Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, I commented on this and I, because they're trendy. I think and so. You know, they're not like a normal thing. No, it's and import so tax, Norbert. It's import tax. Not to get political. <laughs> But this is a, this is why you got a Brexit now, Norbert. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, wow, I didn't know that we were going to go there tonight. All right, let's not go there. Let's go, let's bring it home. So, Norbert, for those who have not been listening uh, to the show forever, um, Norbert, uh, thank you for joining us again here in Dunkin' Donuts. And Norbert is a die hard, I would say, uh, dyed in the wool uh, war machine and hordes fanatic. Is that right? Yes. So right now he is going through. That perennial experience of uh, of war game players, the new edition. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yes, and this but, is something that seems. Now, let me ask you guys this. So, it seems to me now every once in a while they reprint a board game, and when they do, you know, they fluff the rules up or streamline the rules. Or Sometimes, most of the time, they don't even a lot do that. Sometimes it's just maybe better components and a slight tweak. But, but, but miniature games and RPGs also, I would argue, probably do this. Is about every. Five, three to five to six years, they feel like there's a need to, uh, if not reboot them, then mm-hmm. give them a serious tinkering with. Is that is that fair? So I can only speak about War Machine. Yes. Um, so I'm at a disadvantage. But as far as War Machine, I definitely felt Mark II was ready for uh, a reboot after um, six years, mm-hmm. possibly even sooner, like five. Any time between yeah. five or six years, the last two, it's rebooted twice, War Machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was all around five or six years. And I felt it was right. It needed to do that. So I, I like the idea quite a bit. Um, but I don't know about other systems. You can tell me, fill me in on that. Well, it's interesting because remember when we first started the show, War Machine was fresh and new, and it was not going to get updated, and blah 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 blah. <laughs> and that all—I mean, real, i mean, most people, including Privateer Press, probably knew that that wasn't the reality. But that that the fan base was so rapidly against the established, you know, titan in the room that had that that had a ha- habit of doing going to the well every three or four years. Right. That 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 War Machine seemed like it was going to be forever because it had been like five or six or seven years. And now we're into the third reboot, but I think you can also not argue that 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 even though the War Machine reboot reboot from from Mark One to Mark Two and then from Mark Two to Mark Three, both of those were very different experiences. They were both held or they were both dealt with differently than 40k and fantasy, for example. Mm-hmm. 
you know, but I, I but to get to to get back to Russ's point as to the why uh to do it. So so what you're saying, Norbert, is War Machine Mark II was feeling a little stale. The meta had kind of ground down into a into in, into a sort of a standard game where the flexibility of that young game wasn't there anymore. Everybody had sort of figured out the way to maximize the uh, the rules. Um, uh, and also that the rules were getting a little creaky. Uh, with, okay. Because a lot of things were been bolted on over the years. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So you got like little expansions and little things that add to it but don't quite meld with everything else that already exists. Yeah, exactly. That sort of thing. And yep. so was there a fan... Like, was there a, a, a sort of an outcry in the community for it? There was something needed to happen. Yeah, I think everybody was, agreed. It was accepted, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it was just a, a kind of refreshing of the rules, trying to get rid of the creakiness, or a wholesale reboot, uh, there was a bit of a, a range of people's attitudes, but everybody was ready for something new. Interesting. That's interesting, because I think you see this, um, and I don't know if it's just Games Workshop, but I think I, I think of the miniature war games that have rebooted you know, kind of recently. So Malifo is it Malifo on their third edition now? I feel like they are. No, they're no, uh, second. Like second. So yeah. Malifo has gone through this at least once. Malifo um, went through it like last year. Yep. Infinity it, went through it last year. Infinity went through it. Forty um, K went through it a couple years ago. Yeah, is Infinity yeah. second edition or Infinity's yes? Kinda, Infinity is okay, now yeah. second edition. And then Forty K is on like issue number. I don't know what eight seven seven. I think. Um, now, great, it's been around forever, but still. And, and then, when yeah. was the last one? When when did it reboot last? The last forty k. Uh, I want to say two years ago. Yeah, I feel like it's two years ago. And then fantasy, just of course, the Age of Sigmar, which was, which was interesting. <laughs> so most of the games when they reboot, right, don't redo the background material. Mm-hmm. Right? So most games sort of are like, we know you love our background material, but as you well, no, that's over, not true. Actually, if you look at it, Malifaux yeah. does. No, they evolve Malifaux it. advances the story. They advance the story. They don't throw it out. So I well, think... Well, right. That, but I, I what I'm saying, like, everybody... Ages, ad, I mean, yeah, but some I'm, people I'm advance is, the story, some people don't. I think that I think Age of Sigmar fantasy the first one slash that yeah, Age right. of Sigmar is going to be its own animal that we talk about. That's what I mean. I think it's the first full-on reboot, where they basically yeah. said, we're throwing it all out and starting over again. It, it, right. does it, it, could you say that it's not even the same game, really, aside from the name? Uh, I mean, it's, it's not the same game, except they discontinued the old one, so I guess... Uh, well, no. I mean, it uses the same general mechanics, though. Oh, it does, it doesn't okay. it? Yeah. Or, no, maybe it I, does. I, I, no, I think you're right. Not army building, but combat is sort of the same, I think. But I don't know. I, you honestly, no. You know, I uh, all right. I forgot. I mean, we did. We we reviewed it, sort of, basically. Kinda, not really. And I don't. Um, I don't have the. But I mean, I think we all agree that it is almost as if it's like, a reboot. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same essentially, and almost name only. We really. Yeah, that's it, what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it right, was just right. significantly. Yeah. Seventh edition was in 2014, so two years ago. Yeah, just two years ago. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Of 40k. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, so there's been a lot of these, and most it seems like most miniature games feel like it's a thing to do, and I think a lot of it's because. You know, these are very, when you think about the complexity of these games and what's going on here, right? So you've got a lot of models, a lot of rules interactions, and then you're constantly adding new models mm-hmm. and new factions because you couldn't get them all out when the game first launched or you've just had enough time now to create that next faction. Uh, you know, because the early way you change the, change the meta, right, is you create a new faction. All of a sudden, when that one shows up at tournaments, now you've got to have a force or, or, or two that can deal with this other new threat that's different than the other threats, right? Um, but then when you start doing that and things evolve, all of a sudden, as you mentioned, Norbert, rules start getting stretched to their limit and core rules don't work quite right. And at some point, um, you kind of need to level set with now because you didn't know what you didn't know when you started, right? Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's kind of any creative endeavor. I think you run into this. Um, but I also think there's some good, compelling business reasons. So I think the people who do kind of say, you know, hey, is it just a money grab? I don't know if it's a money grab per se, but I do think it's fair when the RPGs do it, you kind of look at it and say, well, it's because there's no one's buying any more books. So if I come out with D and D, you know, four E and then five, yeah. I get, a, I get everybody buys the books again. So there's something there. Um, plus you got to stay in business. You, you know, there's a, there's, a, you can't just not sell the stuff anymore. So, um, I think it's a bit of both, right? But I think as long as you're evolving the rules and making the game better, stronger, faster, I think it's justified. What, what are you guys feelings on this? Go ahead, Craig. Uh, what What are my feelings of what? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, right. I'm trying to figure out what Norbert. the uh, everything. I'm looking uh, at I'm looking at the... Age of Sigmar to see if it's brand new, and everything I'm seeing are like all these releases 
of GW saying it's brand new, but so I, I miss it. So what? <laughs> no, no, he's saying well, the purpose of the of the of the reboot. Of a reboot. You know? Yeah, it, a general. The what do I feel about? Well, what the do you general? feel about? Do, do you feel like even though there's clearly a desire for the company to make money, uh, if the reboot is generally making the games faster, stronger, and better, um, yeah. are you cool with that? I mean, you basically. Oh, I'm 100 yeah. percent cool with it, and. I mean to go down the to go down the list that we have of the basic game, Malifaux, I felt needed it, but mm. didn't change it enough and it was still brain burny for me. Right. Infinity needed it because I love the world and I love the models and the game is super clunky and creaky to me and didn't change that at all. So so like <coughs> I'm not sure like I, I think if we look at your three points, selling to the exi- like like sort of reinvigorating the fan base revitalizing excitement in the community at large and changing or improving the game. I think Malifaux and infinity were listening to other people, not me, which is perfectly fine. Cause I was a, a, an outs, an outskirts consumer at the, at the very most. Um, but as far as games that I enjoy, uh, I mean, 40, when 40 K used to get, used to change, I felt that a lot of the changes weren't really necessary. Until you got into like, I mean, third edition I thought was great. Then in a fourth edition, I was like, what? Ah, fifth edition, sixth edition, <laughs> things started to get wacky. Uh, and then seventh edition feels like a different game. Like I thought that felt like sort of a tailspin. Whereas, what, what do you think? Uh, could you? Could you? I'm sorry. Finish your point. Yeah. Well, well, I was gonna say I'm looking at this list and I'm thinking. War Machine and Hordes really well. No, because you know what? You know what did a great job would be Uncharted Seas. Mm. Uncharted Seas went from, uh, we're going to throw this game together really cool, we have these really cool models, and it was kind of clunky, and it was awkward, and you could see they had all these cool ideas. (coughs) Excuse me. And then they rebooted the game, and it was the same game, but tighter. And I Mm. think they've, uh, I think that, um, so I would put, I would put, um, I would put Spartan Games and Privateer Press sort of in the same category as companies that I thought rebooted games and got a really a, a, a good they, they did it in a good way. They were upfront about it. They they weren't like kind of like hidden in the side pocket and then boom, you're gonna have to buy all this new stuff. Right. Although Mark Three was a you know a different animal, as we'll probably discuss a little bit. But um I thought both of those Ultimately, you felt that the company was doing something to improve the whole process, not just sell to the existing fan base. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. if you yeah. look at those three, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at these three points as, the, as, as what we will accept as the main points, you know, uh, re, reinvigorate selling with the, with the base, uh, excitement in the community or at large, and then improving the game – I think if you come across as only wanting to sell more models, which I think 40K, fair or not, has that in spades as a reputation. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I don't think that was the deal with Malifaux or Infinity. I just feel like the changes they wanted to make to their game took it further away from what I wanted. But mm-hmm. I feel like there was a good will behind it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <clears throat> but as far as a company's goodwill coinciding with my interest... I would put that with Spartan Games with almost every one of their games has gone through that sort of evolution of two two editions relatively quickly, which many people could argue, you know, do a little more playtesting or whatever and, you know, don't have to worry about that two years where we're playing with clunky rules. But both of those, I mean, those steps were, were in my mind, much, very much part of advancing the whole game as an experience. Um yeah, I agree. I think sense, yeah. it does. It seems apparent, at least from War Machine, that they, they there was really solid reasons for the health of the game to make the yep. addition changes. Right. And yep. so, yeah, so it was coming from a good place. And they are stated always that they've wanted older models to be useful. Yeah. Um, you know, and so when they rebalance them or change them around, the intention is to have them all have a place. Now, uh, doing balancing is such a incre- was such a complex thing is difficult, and so some sometimes some models went out a little bit more than others and those might not be the same models as were important in the last edition so you might see then therefore that you have to buy new models or feel like you have to buy new models but again it it never felt like okay 
you, you know, we don't, we want to just sell a whole fleet of new MIPA models that, that haven't been seen before. And so therefore these are now obviously better, right. you know, I think it's just more happenstance. And so I, 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 uh, I I don't know, you know, GW, I know only by the same reputation, but I was very hesitant to get into War Machine in the first place because I never played those kind of games before. I was a historical gamer before that, which doesn't change very much. (laughs) 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 Um, So, um, uh, but yeah, so I was worried about that problem because I didn't want to have just buy stuff over and over again, but uh, I've been really happy about it um, when it, in terms of War Machine because I haven't had that feeling at all. Right. Um, in fact, I've actually welcomed each one of the changes. I think, I, I don't know how you feel about this, I, I wonder if games, ministry games should just establish that they will reboot every five or six years and have people anticipate that. So the, the, st- the staleness or the kind of apathy that might be building towards the end um, I don't know if that maybe helped Turned it or it worsened it because I know once that Mark Three got released for those six weeks or so, and everybody got stopped playing. Well, not everybody, but people got very apathetic about playing Mark Two because no, just nobody cared about it anymore. Right. Um, so maybe it isn't such a good idea to pre-release um, or pre-notify people that a new edition's coming out because of that same problem. But at the same time, then maybe people just realize that they shouldn't walk away from a game because they know that in X time it's going to be an entirely new system. I, d- I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think I think it's interesting. I think I I think most miniature gamers have kind of come to the point where they expect new additions once in a while for a game to succeed. Yeah. But I think there's a couple examples of companies that 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 do it different ways, right? So I think Craig pointed out that uh, Spartan and uh, Privateer. If you look at what they did with their additions, the the game is refined, but it essentially plays the same, right? Mm-hmm. So, like in other words. The tabletop experience isn't altered dramatically. The uh, well, I, I would say Malifaux and Infinity did that. And, and well. Malifaux and Infinity, I think the two that didn't do this well, I would say Games Workshop and uh, Wizards of the Coast, so Dungeons and Dragons. I think what mm-hmm. they did was, at some point, they decided they wanted to refresh it, but they felt there were a couple edition examples where it was a fundamental refresh, right? Like D and D Fourth Edition was a complete fundamental refresh of how D&D works and it was a complete like what people really want is an MMO feeling in their RPG and it was a totally mm. different direction some people liked it because it was different but some people didn't because it was too different and you changed you know and then they came back to fifth edition and now it's a lot of people say fifth edition is their favorite or one of their favorites because it's sort of like second or third edition refined right and brought it to the modern age I think 40k has gone through this where there were different times where they wanted the game to feel very different and very feel very, very abstracted or very, very detailed, very, very random or very, very tactical, right? And they'd go back and forth. And the problem is that those kinds of changes appeal to different groups of gamers. And so when you go back and forth and change, like War Machine and Hordes has always been rules, tournament-ready rules for competitive play, uh, but, you know, crazy um, stylized models and, and wacky fun, right? That's kind of the, the thing. Whereas 40K has gone back and forth from a rule set that you could make tournament ready to a rule set that's definitely designed to never be tournament ready and then something's in the middle. Um, and I think, you know, Age of Sigmar is doing the same thing, right? Age of Sigmar came out, we're throwing away all game, you know, point systems, and now they just announced the second set of rules for Age of Sigmar that's for competitive play mm-hmm. being added on because of fan demand, or maybe they always plan to do that. I don't know, but now how does that work? And, and I think when you do those kinds of changes, though, you, you, fa- you face sort of mass defection or a lot of fan loss, and that's where you know, Pathfinder emerged because D&D went too different with 4th edition. I think some of the early, you know, several years ago changes in 40K were so radical that a lot of, it gave a lot of opportunity to Weird Miniatures, Privateer Press, and others, and Infinity, um, and now um, Gates of Antares and other games to kind of say, hey, there's an opportunity here to go play a fantasy game or a 40K game that's not radically different than what you grew up with, right? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I like it. I, I, um, yeah. I, I think these games are so complex, as I said, and they kind of fall into um, some st- staticness that um, – I welcome the the reboots. I, I think they're exciting because you get to play. And I think you know people are really upset about it in some instances, which I don't understand because it's like you you have all, all the investment that you, none right. of that really goes away. At least in the case of companies that are doing it well, um, but you get a brand new game. I mean, you know, right. it, it, it's a whole new experience for very little money. You know, you have to buy the new rule book or whatever. 
Right. No, I agree with you. I, in fact, I think, um, like, I, I think I would have been disappointed if War Machine became, if they had said, we're throwing out points and we're making it a casual game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Exactly. Like, that would have changed, completely changed the meta and the community of what War Machine has become, right? And so yeah. I'd have been disappointed in that because I have many options for that right now. So I don't want War Machine to become that. So, yes, that had been a complete change and I get a whole new game for my models, but it wouldn't be the game I want anymore. And now I either got to keep the old try to keep a community together of the old rules so I can still play the game I used to love or, or move on to someone else's system because the new game is not the game I want. So mm-hmm. I think Privateer's do, been doing a good job of understanding, and I think you know, Spartan, as Craig said, does it too, and, and, and Weird, understanding what their community wants and refining their game with their customer in mind, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think sometimes other game systems are like, well, how do we expand to a broader group um, well, yep. our, our loyal fans will never leave us because they just like our brand so much. I think D&D had this thinking, and I think Team Games Workshop did too, to just, we'll just completely change it, and whoever's with us will stay because they love us, and we'll get new people. But instead, what happened is, you know, there's other options that are looked at because it's too different than what I used to love, right? Yeah. Um, so well, you gotta, I think you got to be careful with that, is all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Well, I, so you bring up role-playing, uh, and I don't understand it, actually. I used mm-hmm. to play role-play, so I know the game. I know I understand. Mm-hmm. But like, w- aside from just needing to print new books f- to make money, which is fair, um, w- what drives a role-playing game to go to a new release, new edition? I, I think it's the same thing that miniature gamers like. And, Craig, you jump in if, you're, if, you, mm-hmm. if you think differently. But, like, I liked – so, you know, you, you fall in love with – the worlds you create and you fall in love with this, like what a paladin is and what a cleric is, but mm-hmm. are there faster and, and like, like for example, like RPGs involved a lot where there's a lot more storytelling. Uh, there's a lot more dice rolling. Well, it's like, it's always been there, but you can get a lot more dice rolling and in, in art in role playing effects in the non combat situations. Right? right. Like early D and D, was the dice were really about combat mostly with, with minor checks outside of combat. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. it's changed, and a lot of RPGs have introduced concepts of, well, you can make dice checks all the time, and you, you can have role-playing checks and all those other things. And, and I think it's interesting that, you know, it's kind of like, as I play a character like a bard or a paladin or a ranger, can I have more abilities? You know, like, wouldn't it be cool if my ranger could have minor spell capabilities so when he, sh- he shot an arrow, vines wrapped around her and stuff like that? So you like to see how you can make a new ranger that's just a little different than the old ranger. Kind of like it's nice to see how new striker plays compared to old striker, right? In War Machine. Right. So it's that kind of Oh, thing. okay. So I'm right, saying? Yeah. So like, but at I the can, same... Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish up. Well, no, that's all I'm saying. So I think it gives me a new opportunity to play a ranger, play the game I love, same uh, game, but some new options in there just to make it different. So next time I'm rolling up a paladin, it's not my 50th paladin that I roll up exactly the same way. It's a paladin and he feels familiar, but Oh look, he's got this new tweak or Oh wow. I can, by changing his, you know, this, 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 this choice or this background, I can now impact him in different ways and I can build a paladin who can pick locks and some new nuances that, that you didn't expect. Right. So I think yeah. that's part of the, part of the magic. Of it. I'm going to disagree with okay. Russ on this. Yeah, one. go ahead. Uh, as far as role playing, for, first of all, with role play, the, the the whole economics behind role playing games is very different from miniature games, where the vast majority of your money is coming from models. So you've got to take that into consideration when you're going into a next uh, <coughs> into a next edition. And if you don't take that into consideration, a la GW, then you're in dangerous territory, which is not generally something that you have to worry about from a from a role playing perspective, where your money. First of all, it's a far less lucrative niche of the gaming community. Well, that's true. Um, and, and if I mean, and if you've done any work in it, which, which I have, and Nicole has as well, um, you know that the money is not there. The money is. If you look at most of these role playing, the companies, the guys, you know, they're they're work a day kind of guys. Most of them have other jobs. They love this. They've been working on the, you know, the small, especially the smaller publishers. And where they're getting their, like what Russ is saying, like, oh, you, you want new experience with your paladin. Well, what most of those companies are going to do, then they're going to do a supplement, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the paladin yeah. supplement. Yeah. And yeah. so you're going to get a hundred different supplements for these smaller companies. Uh, and and the, the, the supplement's going to be, they're going to start splintering off and they're going to be like uh, the, the fighter supplement, but then, ooh, the, the, the paladin supplement. And when that gets overwhelming and that gets to be crazy, then I think you're forced into a sort of a reboot. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Which kind of 
And at the same time, I think rule the, the mechanics of role playing have evolved a lot. I, well, I think the mechanics of everything have evolved a lot, to be honest. But if you look at what people are like crunchy percentiles versus fluffy dice with little symbols on them, you know, that's a huge uh, <coughs> shift in, yeah. in, in philosophy. And so I think when you see that happening in the industry, you might be going, well, what are we going to do to be up and current? And, you know, nobody wants tables anymore. Now they all want, you know, the die that actually says whatever it is on the die facer or whatever. And, um, and so I think that's a lot of what it is. And then I think some of it, and I think this is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Wizards of the Coast issue is how do we well, like we we now own the van we own the vanguard that is us we are the flagship of role playing we have Dungeons and Dragons and we're losing ground how can that be what do we have to do and and there's a then that's then the economics kick in and the yeah. uh, and the yeah. and the market share kicks in and sure. I think that's when you go to you know what we're gonna, everybody likes you know everybody likes. Um, World of Warcraft. We're gonna make game. We're gonna make Dungeons and Dragons. World of Warcraft, the role playing game, which is what you had in Fourth Edition, which had to be the shortest lived edition of Dungeons and Dragons ever. Mm. And yeah. I know that Russ enjoyed it. Mm. I hated it. Well, five is yeah. much better though. What's uh, that? Fifth Edition is much better, and I think they yeah. No, I, I agree one hundred percent. And I yeah. think that's what happened was they went, we got to stay relevant. We're the, our mechan- our right. mechanics are falling behind. We're losing to Path- Pathfinder. What are we going to do? Boom, we're going to make it, you know, World of Warcraft, the role-playing game. And some, like Russ, wa- Russ was the guy who, when, when Russ was saying, like, your, your people who love your product are going to stick mm-hmm. with your product and you're trying to expand it, Russ was that guy who loved D&D. Mm-hmm. And so was, and I, I'm not saying it was a bad game. It just wasn't the game I wanted to play, and it wasn't the way my mind wanted to envision right. a Dungeons and Dragons world working. And you have a much broader acceptance level t- for almost all game mechanics, and so you saw like the world was the same, and the pa- paladin was wearing the same shiny armor, and it was just a different paradigm that he was working within. So you you were able to still enjoy that, and that's and that's why I think you like a lot of games. Which is awesome, and and it's uh, probably one of your superpowers. <laughs> and, um, whereas I I I am more like curmudgeonly, I think, and I'm like, arg! If it's not going to be better, I want it to be the same kind of thing. Right, and that's sort yeah. of it going to create my creative side. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. It's hard to do the mute mute button while I'm the one talking. Mm-hmm. Um, like change or spectacle for change or spectacle's sake i tell my students is flat it's well, if, if there's right. not a reason for you to do that thing or to, ex- to explore that theme or to 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 it, you know like imagine that special effect if there's no reason for your film to suddenly cut to black and white like you as the designer of this project have no idea why just because it would be cool yeah. then I think it's going to fall flat and it's going to kill your project. And I feel the same way with, we're going to change the mechanics. Why? Because yeah. we think it's neat. And, I, and, I think that's right. I, and I'm not saying that's what they did. No, it is what they did. I think, I, think yeah. I, I, would, I, would, I would flat out state that Games Workshop and Wizards of the Coast both have done this. So yeah. that was D&D 4. D&D right. 5 is what D&D 4 should have been, which is exactly. a really cool iteration on classic D&D. That's what, yeah. that's what the new War Machine and Hordes is. That's what the new Uncharted Seas is. That's what the new Malifaux is. It's well, sadly, still, Uncharted Seas it would is be dead, like, but It would the, be like if Malifaux, newer, yeah. if Weird Minute just woke up one day and said, you know what, this whole card mechanic is dumb. We're going to dice. Yeah. Well, that would be a huge yeah. mistake because that's, that's what their fans fell in love with. And, right. you know, you, yes, you could argue that it appeals to more people, but now you're just a Me Too skirmish game, so don't do that, right? right. And yeah. I think 40K... You know, you know, you could look at Age of Sigmar with GW saying, "Well, privateers already figured out how to do competitive play. We're going to just up the stakes on non-competitive <laughs> we're gonna, play. We're going to throw... do the most non-competitive you can possibly right. be." Which, which you know, fine, own it, I guess. But it's also a very big change when you are the game company that originally invented the point system, pretty much, right? right. <laughs> um, and, and kind of invented all the the multi-faction rules and all that stuff, and and allies and all. They, they kind of set the groundwork and. 
if they didn't invent it, they certainly established it in the 80s and 90s. Well, I think they absolutely did because so, so, historical right. games have always been established. And sort of this to, other thing. In my experience, right. have always been designed around what were the actual forces in that battle. Right. So why which are you- almost never balanced. And so right. you're basically recreating a battle rather than yeah. – yeah. A system that can be used across battlefields, across time and space, and you know, et cetera. Yeah. So I just I think my only thing about this stuff is I I agree with you, Norbert. I think it's great when the games iterate on what they're successful on and refine what they do and force us to sort of reexamine our 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 assumptions about what a good army list is or you know what makes a good paladin or whatever. Um, yeah. But it yeah. still needs to feel like the game it was. Right, I yeah. don't think it can fundamentally yeah. change. If the game fundamentally yeah. changes, um, then I might as well buy a whole new franchise. And at that point, then I'm going to look at other game systems. And I, that's, and that's right. That's yeah, that's a good point. You know? Exactly. Uh, hey, um, I wanted to contrast all this with the way Magic: The Gathering works. Yeah, yeah. Um, because they don't do reboots, as far as I know. Uh-huh. Um, they uh, ever i don't think they've ever done one mm-hmm. um what they do do is put out a new edition of cards and i understand that i don't know very much about this but i, I think each edition has a tends to have like a kind of mechanic that it kind of um features mm-hmm. um not, not so it'll be a little tweak of the rules or, or a slightly new rule um that they kind of all kind of play around on um but, but what is quite different from miniature games historically anyway is that they then for their normal tournament scene, will retire cards from older um, releases that have come out. Yeah. And so I have two questions. One, do you think because they retire, they don't need to reboot? And secondly, should miniature games possibly look at retiring models at some point? Not maybe as frequently as card games do, but at some point, such that they have more space to work with new stuff uh, and also have maybe more healthy company as a result because the income will continuously come in. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think that's a really interesting question. I, have yeah. to I think the, the trick with magic is that most of the rules in magic are on the cards, right? So there's the core mechanics of magic are pretty straight up, right? They're mm-hmm. not very complex. Mm. So if they do goof up something, then it usually is goofed up on the card. Um, whereas I think the thing miniature games have a problem with is that when they start to evolve, like you get to the point where you can afford to make larger, like let's say it's a sci-fi game, you can add vehicles or flyers or other things like that. Um, and all of a sudden it, it messes with the core mechanics. Retiring an infantry model doesn't really fix that, right? You need to, you know what I mean? So I guess that part I that part I think would be tricky. Um, I well, yeah, but you're saying is it a way to kind of fix the core rules? I yeah. I was looking at it more of a way to keep a game fresh without having. Well, why to... Why can't you fix the? Why can't you just fix the card? Like I like War Machine kind of does this now, right? I mean, they don't retire a model, but mm. Haley's card can change tomorrow. Right. And, a, lot of, a lot of games do that. Yeah. So Haley's rules, and especially with War Room, which is one of the things I think is brilliant about the app when it works. Uh, but if it's working. Um, Basically, I just turn my phone on, and I've got the latest edition of my Warcaster. And if they changed him last night, well, I've got the latest rules. And yeah. they can, so they don't retire. So the problem Magic has is they can't go back, because they're physical media, they can't go back and just all of a sudden change a particular monster's card text. Yeah, right? that's so right. So what they got to do is either kill the card uh, so they can make a new variant on it that's right. Like, let's say they want to kill the old giant spider and make a new hairy spider that's essentially the giant spider but with a fixed rule or whatever. They can do that, but they can't go back and kill that old card because it's physical. But, with, but if you can get the digital cards, like with War Machine, um, now you're all set because now you can just tweak the rules if, if one of Haley's rules screws things up. Yeah, I think, see, I, I agree with that. But I also see that it gets harder and harder for a company to add models to their line mm-hmm. because of the balancing issues. Uh, and also probably having enough design space to to have something new and fresh to offer. Well, well there's also there's only so much space on store shelves too, so you only have so many SKUs. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So you got to decide if, if you're going to keep having Haley on the shelf, or you're going to retire her and introduce a new Warcaster, right? I mean, that's, that, that this yeah. is what I'm trying to suggest. Yeah, like, right. why doesn't? I mean, I know historically that that's not how the industry works, and everybody would have to get used to it. So I understand that's you know that that this has to happen, but. To introduce the concept, I, I, I don't see it necessarily as uh, maybe a bad thing. 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I, I know people, and I know, I heard Craig already saying, "Oh, you know, about my models. You know, I've invested so much in my models, and none." And I agree. I and mean, it's not even the money; it's the time that you put into right. Um, yeah. right. But I, 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 at the same time, I have models that have sat in my case for years because they're not useful. That is true. Years, and so what's the difference if they went away from the game uh, for whatever reason? Mm. And I'm not talking like magic where they, they get – I think each set comes out now every th- four months. Uh, you know, so there's a rotation every four months. I'm talking about models retiring after two years, uh-huh. three maybe. I don't know. What do you think, Craig? Uh, I, I don't think – if I'm active in a game, like when I was – well, I don't know. Because my impulse, my ner- knee-jerk reaction is what exactly. you just said. Yep. But when you think about it, yes, I have – I mean, I have models that I haven't used in decades, obviously, because I haven't played the games that they're for in decades. Um, I have models I've never used that I like the look of the model. I paint it up and then it doesn't fit in with what I'm trying to do or the game like goes out of fashion for a while. Um, like I have over over 60 War Machine models for this Retribution faction, and I would say less than 30 of them have ever seen the table. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. But I, but what, what your challenge would be to get people to realize that and get over that knee jerk reaction of oh by the way, be, and you what you'd be working against in part is uh, the bad taste that GW has left when they've yeah. killed entire armies. Yeah, yeah, you know, and so yeah, I'd so, say there's definitely like, a big challenge there. But. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's one or two models per army, maybe, but if you're gonna like plow under an entire army at a time then i think i don't know yeah no like i, I think you I could keep it fresh yeah i think I, I it's an intriguing idea doesn't spartan have an interesting response to this so if, doesn't firestorm armada do a thing where they have stopped making the legacy sculpts of certain ships right but yeah. what they did was they have a new variant that looks completely different but what they did was they have two different sets of rules right there's like the old Rules for the old, like, you know, original right. class starship. Yeah. Uh, you can still use them. They're legal rules. And then they right. have the new fancier version, but you can't buy the old model anymore. So the old model and the old rules are only available to classic players who've been around that long because the new mm. players are all going to have the new rules. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. Now, the other option would be to just say, well, the new rules apply to both sculpts. You just have the old class yeah. and the new class, and, and eventually the old class will go away. Uh, but I kind of like this idea that there's this variant, you know, on the model. If you think about Privateer played around with that idea too, Norbert, right? With some of the some of the jacks, like some of the character jacks were just like one arm different, right, or whatever. And you'd have a different yeah. arm, and all of a sudden it's a different flavor of that jack, right? And you could okay, imagine sure. old sculpts, and, and they're doing that now, right? They got the new sculpt of the Thunderhead and the old sculpt. That one's the plastic, and one's the old metal one, or whatever. Um, but the rules are the same, you know. That kind of thing happens, but. Um, I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I kind of, you know what was cool, Norbert? This is part of the fun. Like, when I played my very first Mark III game with Craig, I mm-hmm. made sure that my Ironclad was in the list. So my Ironclad is an original sculpt of original Prime Mark I yeah. Ironclad, which Matt Wilson told us once in an interview that was the very first model ever made for War Machine. Right. Um, so it's kind of cool to me that that very first model, that very first sculpt, is still on the table and effective, you know, what is it, 14 years oh, later? Russ, I mean, in the, in, in the interest cool. of honesty, effective, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> he was alive at the end. He I mean, not, not when he's got mage warriors pushing well, them all over the well, table. I just mean, he was, that's because of this new scenario <laughs> that got him separated from his war caster. Stupid scenario. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just but, kidding. But, he scared the heck out of me. <laughs> but that's what he, I'm saying. He He's killed been, a bunch of witch hunters. I've had that model since the beginning, and it's gone through Mark 1 for years, Mark 2 for years, and he's he's been on the table more times than he hasn't. So I think that's it's true. cool to me that I can have this guy, this like old friend that's been doing battle with me now for you know on my side for this many years. So I, I kind of I like that. I, I hope Privateer at least keeps that as part of their tenants. Um, I, I wouldn't quit the game if they ever got rid of, you know, the iron, the iron clad or whatever in flavor of, you know, the Hammersmith or some other flavor of it. But um, it's just cool to me that that first model. Oh, of you know what's Star going game. on here? What's that? I'll tell you what's going on. This is the difference <laughs> yes. between the concept of like the, like the constitutional monarchy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> has this, 
sort of sure. legacy that reaches back through time. Yeah, yeah. Versus this upstart democracy that just churns out new stuff and steps on the old stuff. And Norbert's going to get himself in a lot of trouble over there in old blight <laughs> if he doesn't keep his mouth shut. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah. I guess so. Possibly. <laughs> well, I think you're right, though. I think I think there's a lot of um, um, uh, legacy of miniature games yeah, that would make yeah. this. But I think if a company came out and stated this is the kind of the model, so you can expect it, mm-hmm. you know, the, the business model that is. Um, I, I wonder if people would buy into it. And and like I said, like Magic, you get a refresh refreshment of the game with. Without having to go to these like really massive changes, because look, we've been all positive about these changes, but there's been a good number of people who are really upset about, yeah. or do get upset whenever a yeah. reboot happened. Oh, and, yeah. Always, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, the question is, is you know, is the reboot um, does it gain more players or retain more players than it loses? But you yeah. definitely still lose them. So I think, I maybe think this kind of model would change that kind maybe, of. Um, but I think you're just going to change the complainers, right? Because someone's going to complain that you just retired their model, right? I mean, I you sure, see it for sure. other game systems too, where even if they don't retire the model, they change the rules in a way where like, oh, look, now that unit's nerfed, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm right. never going to play Kaya again. She can't spirit throw every model in her force anymore. That sucks. Mm, you mm. know, so, so you can see... You can see it from both sides. But I hear what you're saying, Norbert. It's an interesting model, and I think it'd be neat to see someone try it. Um, I feel like Spartan kind of is. Um, I don't, I don't, maybe, see, I don't really maybe see the parallel. And I think you'd be in dangerous, in dangerous territory if you made that big statement and then you realized, as I think most game companies do, somewhere down the line you're going to have to make actual changes to your game. Yeah. <laughs> Just because, as, you know, as the... As, as the number of ge- of plays that it gets goes from the hundreds to the thousands to the hundreds of thousands, if you're lucky, mm. just like anything else in h- the human experience, it's going to start shaking out. Right. And you're going to be like, oh, but we've been replacing these models, and you're going to find something that just replacing the models can't fix. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. But but uh, what, what it could address is that, I mean, one thing that we haven't talked about that kind of fits into this tangentially is companies constantly have to come out with new models to keep things fresh for their existing right. play ba- player base and what do you do to do that oh well you think they're a little more powerful you know the model might be a little more attractive but it's a little more powerful and then you've got that power creep and i think that might be what your idea addresses more than the need for a reboot would be the need for a like that might be a way to control power creep yeah you know, no, I, yeah, I think it's got some merits and things. I think like if I think you there's said, something, to, there is something to think about there. If you you say to the people, we're going to go up to having a, a base of fifty skews per faction, let's say, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and that's it. So like you know that you know that means that when we re- release a new model, another model gets retired. So you know you're always kind of having this like base number of models. Just so you still have plenty. Um, it's not like you know you have to constantly cycle them, but right. you, it's just expected. I, I wonder if it would work. No one's tried it, so. And, you know, these days you have to be a little different, so maybe somebody will. Yeah, that's true. Interesting. Well, Norbert, thank you so much for uh, catching up with us here in Dunkin' Donuts. I really appreciate you taking the time here to come across the entire ocean. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a here. That's, few uh, boxes with me, if yeah, that's okay. Hide do. them from the wife. Get her from husband, right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let her see the Boston cream because there'd be re- revolution. See what I did there? Ooh, ooh see what uh, you did there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, anywho, so Norbert, we'll have you back on the main show here shortly because we got to talk about all these wacky changes to Mark Three. What do we think? Yes. Are they good? Can't yeah. wait. Yeah. I good. can't wait because I, I can't wait because Russ taught me Mark Three, and we all know that that means I need somebody else to teach me Mark Three. Yeah. <laughs> got probably about half the rules wrong. All yeah, right. Make that probably. We'll chat with you fun. in about a week, Norbert. All right, then. All right, Let's do it then. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for purchasing a D6G Lost Chapter. Supporting the show helps it grow.